may be watched. One of those, or those videos I posted for, it seems like a week ago, Wednesday, um, when MTSU started late because of the weather. <laughs> yeah. Um, Definitely do the watch the one for the completing um, Flannery O'Connor's Good Man is Hard to Find. I will post, I, I've not looked at the quizzes yet. Um, I will post a quiz for Good Man is Hard to Find today. It will probably be due Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. And I will also post at the same time an exam over the fiction. So over all the previous stuff, um, the three short stories, that will be due probably a week from today. Okay, so you'll have plenty of time to get it done. Um, and you can review previous quizzes, obviously, um, to help prepare for that, for that exam. Um, and I'll try to get the O'Connor quiz um, graded definitely sometime on Thursday. More than likely what I'll do is I'll just keep checking it and as people finish, if it's not multiple choice, I haven't decided yet what it's going to be. Um, if it's not multiple choice, you know, I'll just grade them as they come in and publish them so that you can access those. Uh, the other stuff that I posted, the intro to Sophocles, Greek drama and set, we're going to go over a little bit of that intro kind of stuff today. We're going to try to get into the play. Um, so, having said that, I did start, yeah. Um, make sure you go over those terms on pages 11, 22 to 26, the, the terms in bold print. But also, there are five terms in italics on one of those pages. I don't remember the exact page. Well, I could probably tell you. Page. Yeah, on 1124, um, the five parts of a tragedy, prologue, paradox, decimon, episode, etc. Know those also, okay? I'm going to talk briefly, 10, 15 minutes maybe, about these terms, and then when we get into the play, I'll talk about this a little bit, and before we get into the play, I'll talk about these a little bit. So. 9.15, we'll probably, we probably won't get to talk about actually um, Oedipus the King until 9.45 or so, okay? So, let me start with these terms. And all of this information comes from Aristotle, who wrote a book called On Poetics or The Poetics, depending upon the translation you use. And he bases most of what he says there on, about tragedy at least, because he's not only talking about drama, he also talks about other poetry. He bases everything he says about tragedy on Oedipus the King. He uses that as the highest form of tragedy there is. So he'll pull out samples from um, Oedipus to discuss all of these, right? So, a couple of these terms. Deus ex machina means God from the machine. Okay? And, and all that refers to is in ancient Greek drama, um, they would have a way, maybe through a trap door or, you know, through some kind of contraption over, you know, coming out of the the Skene, the house or the building at the back of the stage. These are terms that are in the introduction, so know all those. Um, the Skene and such. They would have a means for a god within the play to miraculously appear and to possibly at times remove someone or remove something. Okay? And that would occur to bring about the resolution of the play. And what Aristotle said was, when you have to have a deus ex machina ending, you don't have a good tragedy. Why? What, is, what does that say when you have to have a 
this thing, God from the machine, come and solve the problem? Lazy. Okay, it's lazy for one thing. It's not actually one of the reasons he uses it, but that works, okay? How's it lazy? I mean, instead of... I, mean, I understand what you mean, but... Instead of solving the problem, like, naturally, you're just throwing something in that's like, oh, this can fix anything, right? I, mean, I don't want to get into theological issues, you know, once beliefs and such. How often do miracles happen? <laughs> it, it's, you know, it, it doesn't happen rationally. Let me put it that way. And Aristotle's all about reason. All about reason and logic. Okay? Um, not so much his teacher. I mean, Plato was about reason and logic, but Plato also was a very firm believer in God. A single monotheistic God. Not the gods. As was Socrates. Okay? His his teacher, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, in that order. Socrates was the teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Okay? So, if you have to have a deus ex machina resolution, you don't have a good tragedy. All right? Or good play. Amartya. Notice I didn't pronounce the... Hamar, it's okay if you say hamartia. Hamartia, Greek word, it literally means to miss the mark. Okay? Or to not achieve what you aimed for. When that word is used in the Greek version of the New Testament, and it's used a lot, okay, it gets translated into English as the word sin. Okay. But what's the difference between missing the mark and sin? I mean, if I were to throw this at one of you, you know, Yusef, and I didn't hit him, that would be missing the mark. So, is that bad? Not necessarily. This What does this imply? Did something wrong. Louder? You did something wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'll keep or going. You didn't do something right. Keep going. What does that imply on the part of the person doing the wrong thing? What's the difference between first degree murder and negligent homicide? Negligent manslaughter intention you intend to kill versus you know cutting a tree down tree falls down hits the neighbor's car the neighbor's backing out of the driveway smack they're dead oops didn't mean for that to happen versus neighbors driving me crazy and i go over and boom you know that's very intentional that's very much this this doesn't have to be intentional. All right? It's, I mean, it's key to get that. This often gets translated. Your book mentions. Often gets translated fatal flaw. That the character, the tragic character, the tragic hero, has a amartia or Fatal flaw is how it's often put in his or her character. Now, fatal flaw implies what? Yeah, there's something in me that's going to lead towards death. I have some character defect. Again, that's different than this. That's different than this. It's very different than that. All right? That's why the, the fatal flaw translation is, is not a good rendering of it, okay? Now, Aristotle does go on to say that usually this amartia, this missing the mark, is the result of this. 
hubris. Sometimes it's spelled with a Y, H-Y-B-R-I-S, okay? Hubris, excessive pride or excessive arrogance. Now, some prides are fine, right? If you ace every test in every class you get, every class you have, you should be proud of that. That's, that's well done. If you're, you know, Usain Bolt, used to be, fastest man in the world, that's something to take some pride in. If you're the third fastest person in the world, and you're trash talking, you know, Usain Bolt or something, it, not so good. If you're mediocre and you say you're the best there ever was, not so much. If you're the fastest man in the world now and say I'm the fastest man who ever will be, you left the path of reason and gone off to this, all right? Usually in a Greek tragedy, when a character suffers from this, and Aristotle says, most tragic characters, this is their problem. Or, to go back to this, the mistranslation, this is their fatal flaw. Okay? They don't think they can make a mistake. And what this often gets to, or the or best way to look at it is, it's arrogance or pride bordering on the godlike. Thinking that one is godlike. Greek society, no. You never assume, one never assumes that one is godlike. Okay? For the simple reason, and I'm going to ask you to do this for the purposes of reading, you know, these, these, this and Antigone if we're able to do it. Got to put yourself in the Greek mindset. So, 21st century, gone. We're no longer in the 21st century. We are living in 500 BC Greece, okay? That means around us, there are all kinds of beings that we don't see. Gods, spirits, all right? And the gods are very real. And guess what the gods are very jealous of? their godlikeness, their godness. And so when a human says, oh, I'm going to be like the gods, the gods are going to be like Megatron and go, <clears throat> and they're just going to flick you off into an outer existence. Or, I mean, one thing is, they'll immediately snuff you, or they're going to draw out your pain and suffering for a long time. Oedipus, or... Prometheus, or Tantalus, or a lot of other Greek myths, okay, where people suffer for eternity because they overstepped their place and acted like a god. Okay? So that. This is kind of modern, modern parlance. This would be like a president. I'm actually gonna, not going to name one because... Just about all the presidents that I can remember have been guilty of this. It's like a president not admitting making a mistake. Nope, not going to do it. Just, I was right. Given the circumstances, I was right. You know, kind of a thing. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the case. You know, and I can remember going back to Lyndon Johnson, earliest memory. Um, there might be one or two. I mean, Jimmy Carter, before he was president, you know, I send in my heart, told Playboy interview, lusted after a woman. Okay, but that's not when you were president, you know. Anyways, so you've got those. Two other terms. These refer to this kind of a structure, if you want. So I'm going to talk about these and then talk about that structure. Two other major kind of terms. Yeah, three, because I forgot I've got that one written up. Reversal and recognition. These both revolve or involve around the main character of a Greek tragedy. Notice I used the phrase main character rather than protagonist. Okay? 
The main character of a Greek tragedy is called the protagonist. Okay? It comes from two words, protagonist. Proto means first, or chief, or main. Okay? Agonist. What word do we get from that today? Agony. First, main, chief, agony. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you are in agony, then you are suffering. The, in, in the ancient Greek Olympics, the wrestlers were called the agonists. Why? There weren't rules. I mean, there was the circle, but that was pretty much it. You want to dislocate a shoulder? Have at it. Bend fingers back, wrist up, every any joint there is that can be, go for it. You do whatever it took to defeat your opponent, kind of thing. Lots of agony, in other words. Okay? So the proto-agonist is the first chief or main sufferer in a Greek tragedy. Usually, not all the time, usually, the vast majority of times, the play is named for the chief sufferer, or named after Oedipus the king. Guess who's going to suffer the most? Oedipus. The tragedy of Romeo, leave Greek and go to Shakespeare. Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Mercutio's not the one who suffers the most. Neither is Tybalt. It's Romeo and Juliet. Tragedy of Julius Caesar. Caesar's the one who suffers the most. Okay? You could go through every one of Shakespeare, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, etc. King Lear. Here's, here's where there's possibly. <clears throat> I'm not saying this is, is the case. I'm saying it's possibly the case. Assuming we're able to read it, if we have time. Sophocles' play Antigone. Who's the chief sufferer? Okay. Now, you've not read the play, unless you have. Um, you don't know why I'm raising that question. I'm raising that question because I'm going to make it that we are going to read this. So just somebody else might be the chief sufferer. Okay, I'll just say that. Um, come over here for a moment. This is a visual way of representing the structure of a tragedy or a comedy. Okay. So, play begins right here. And you have the rising action. I don't, I don't have it here, but it has to begin with what? Okay, that's exposition. What else? Maybe a prologue if you talk about the five parts. But it always comes in the prologue. You get the conflict. The conflict is introduced. You, you cannot have... A play, you cannot have a work of fiction without conflict. You can't have poems. There's a ton of poems in your book that have nothing to do with conflict. Some of them are entirely imagistic. They're just creating images or senses, let's say. But in drama, you've got to have conflict. Why? It defines humanity. It defines human interactions, me with you guys, and guess what? Defines us up here. We're often in conflict with ourselves, kind of a thing. Okay? So the conflict that leads to the rising action, the complication, exposition, background information gets related there. We'll talk about that um, when we get into Oedipus. Crayon. Crayon comes from the Oracle at Delphi. He tells Oedipus what Apollo has said needs to be done, and then he says, Oh, by the way, let me tell you a story. <laughs> and the story is what happened to the previous king. Okay? All exposition. Then you get the climax. The climax is the center point of tension. And it's when there's boom, it's all reached that point. Most suspense. At the climax, 
You get the beginning of these. Okay? Recognition and reversal, or if you want to use the Greek, the anagnoresis or the peripeteia. Peripeteia, literally, literally, it kind of means the walking around. And what in this context means you're going this direction, and then all of a sudden you're going this direction. You, re, you turn, okay? And here is when the, client, the tragic hero starts to fall. This is the point where the, where the, I always keep saying climate, where the tragic hero is at the highest, but it, it's a knife's edge. And he always, she, he or she, always steps over the edge. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a tragedy. And we get the resolution or the unraveling or the French denouement. Okay? And at the end of the play is where in most tragedies, the tragic hero dies. Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, Lear, Caesar, etc., etc. He doesn't in Oedipus the King. If you're not read it before, I just gave away the ending. Oedipus doesn't die. Why? He gets the long, drawn out suffering. All right? The interesting thing is when a comedy begins, comedy begins the same way as a tragedy. In fact, a comedy has the same structure, essentially. Notice here I put falling action. Well, that's because, in a sense, this is a falling action, too. Oedipus just isn't aware. He's falling as the play begins. And this is bottom of the barrel until the bottom drops out and he keeps falling more. So in a comedy here, all right, you get the introductory conflict. See, both of these, this introductory conflict, it involves some kind of rupture of society, some kind of disruption in the fabric of society. Society's not all nice and peaceful. In Oedipus the King, what's wrong with Theban society? Play. Play. Animals are dying, livestock's dying, agriculture's dying, women are having stillborn children, death everywhere, okay? Not a sustaining society. In comedy, you've got that same kind of rupture at the beginning. Often, the rupture revolves around love. Either two lovers are forbidden to love each other, or, well, it, it's usually that. <laughs> Two lovers are forbidden to love each other. The question is, who's doing the forbidding? In almost all of Shakespeare's, it's dad. Yeah. Dad won't let daughter love who she wants. Okay? Sometimes it's a stand-in for dad, a lord or something like that. Okay, So that's the rupture at the beginning. You have the rising action the complication, the exposition, background information that we need, and then the climax. And it's at the climax here in a comedy that determines what the play is going to be. Because at that point, it either becomes a comedy and the rupture starts to be repaired or it becomes Think Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet could be a comedy. What, or what does it take? What does it not take? <laughs> Death. If one of them doesn't commit suicide, then the other one's not going to commit suicide, and you run off happily ever after. That's a Midsummer Night's Dream play we're going to read. Okay? So, at the climax in the comedy, with the reversal and the recognition, what happens is characters' eyes are opened to kind of reality. And when you get to the end of the play, the rupture is sewn back together. 
Society is made whole. And I'm trying to think of one. Nobody dies. Shakespeare has some problem plays. <laughs> they're not tragedies, they're not comedies, they're tragic comic, they're kind of in between. But even in those, what you do about nothing and measure for measure, nobody really dies. Even Winter's Tale, which is a romance, there's an implied death, but a not a real death. Right? Society is restored with this one proviso. In at least all of Shakespeare's comedies that I'm familiar with, which is most of them, at the end of the play, everybody's quote unquote happy but one. There's always one person who doesn't get what he or she wants. In Midsummer Night's Dream, it's Hermia's father, the guy who said, my daughter needs to die, okay? Um, the Duke overrules him, okay? And as you like it, it's Jaquie. I think it's as you like it. Yeah, pretty sure that's right. So there's one person who, who isn't happy. Why? Because it's real. Nobody ever gets 100% happiness, right? In Shakespeare's kind of mimicking reality there. Okay. Uh, One other thing, three unities. This comes from Aristotle again, based on the poetics. He bases his ideas about these unities, again, on Oedipus the king. Aristotle said, every good tragedy, every good drama, let me rephrase that. Um, every good drama ought to follow these three Unities, okay? Unity of time, unity of place, unity of action. What does he mean by unity? Oneness, completeness, completeness of time, 24 hour time period. That is, the play occurs within a single 24 hour day. Oedipus the king. All happens in the span of a day. Antigone happens within the span of a day, okay? Um, Unity of place. There's one location. Everything in this play happens where? In front of the palace of Thebes. Okay? Unity of action. One plot. That's it. By the time Shakespeare's writing, 2,000 years later, roughly, Shakespeare probably doesn't know yeah, Shakespeare is not familiar with Aristotle's poetics. Shakespeare doesn't follow these. Later, English critics criticize Shakespeare for not following Aristotle. Okay? Because Shakespeare's plays don't occur within a 24-hour time span. There's days, and in some of them, years go by within the action on the stage. Place, you've got all different kinds of settings. Action, if one thing, if there's one thing next to puns that Shakespeare loves, it's multiple plots. So you have big arch, overarching plot, and then all these little plots, and all these little plots are threads that have all got to be woven into the overarching plot. Aristotle was like, no, 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 that's too confusing. Okay? But bear in mind, when Aristotle's writing, excuse me, and when Sophocles is writing, Drama's really young. I mean, drama's pretty new. When, when the first, and I can't remember his name, first dramatist, one actor. Think about that for a moment. What do you have when you have one actor, one character? Monologue. That's it. One person comes out and they just recite. Not one actor like somebody doing a one-person version of Kevin Klein um, did a one-man, and, and Patrick Stewart did it too, did a one-man, a Christmas carol. 
where he did all the parts. Pretty hard, by the way. Um, it's not that. <laughs> it's one person just speaking. The next big innovation was two characters. Now they talk to each other. Okay, you can have a little action. Then, by the time Sophocles comes around, you've got three or more characters. Okay, and then it you know just blossoms out from there. So that when Shakespeare comes around, you end up with piles of dead bodies on the stage. All right. Um, so unity is a time, place, action. Now, for Monday, print out this version of the play. Because beginning on Monday, we're gonna, I'm going to use this one. For today, we'll use what's in um, your textbook. Your textbook has the, it's either the Green or Lattimore translation. I can't remember. This is Robert Fagel's. Um, they're all fantastic classes. I just like this one better. And primarily because I like the last lines so much better than the last lines in the Green translation. So. The play opens. Uh, let me back up. How many of you know the basic story? A few of you. Let me give you the basic story. And the reason I'm doing this is, is because Sophocles' audience knew the basic story. This is an old myth. Okay? So when they went to the amphitheater and took their seat on that hard stone, you know, carved seat. They all went in expecting Oedipus the king, knowing a set amount of information about Oedipus. Here's the information they knew. Oedipus does not know this. Okay? So just... Oedipus has two parents, obviously. His father's name is Laius. His mother's name is Jocasta. We're going to see them. Jocasta is pregnant with Oedipus. An oracle comes to them. That is, a prophecy from the god. And the prophecy says, the baby in your womb is fated to kill you, Laius, and marry in sleep with you, Yocasta, and bring forth a brood of children that should never see the light of day. And they look at each other and they go, no, no, that's not going to happen. She delivers the child. The baby, when it's only a couple of days old, has its ankles pinned together. That is, a nail is driven through them. Okay? Given to a shepherd, the shepherd is told, take the baby to the mountain and leave him there for wild animals to eat. Okay? This happened for oh, a couple thousand years at least. <laughs> it still happens in parts of the world, like India. Little girls are left to die. Okay? Um, the shepherd takes the baby, is getting ready to drop the baby under a bush, and meet somebody else. The shepherd feels pity for the baby, gives the baby to this other person who is another shepherd. That shepherd takes the baby home to his city slash state, which is the town of Corinth, and the baby is raised by the king and queen of Corinth. Their names are Polybus and Merope. The baby's raised as their son. Okay. There's a dinner party one evening, and a drunk stands up and calls the son of the king and queen, now named Oedipus, because of his feet. Oedipus means club foot, because his ankles have these big bony growths on them, and he walks with a limp. The drunk says, you're a bastard. Now, he might mean that literally. He might mean it figuratively. Oedipus takes it to mean he's illegitimate. That is, he's not the real son of Polybus. He goes and asks his parents. Don't, he was a drunk. Who are you going to listen to, us 
or a drunk. Okay. But it just eats away at his mind. So he goes to the Oracle of Delphi. The same oracle that told Lys and Yocasta about their child. And he asks of the Oracle of Delphi. And the oracle says, you are fated to kill your father, sleep with your, marry and sleep with your mother, and bring to light a brood of children that should never see the light of day. And he's like, no. So what does he do? He runs away from home. Why? Because he loves his mother and father, and he doesn't want to kill his father, and he doesn't love his mother in that way. He meets a man at a crossroads. The man won't move, so he kills him. He keeps going down the road. He meets a sphinx, like the sphinx at the, at the, near the pyramids of Giza, on the plains of Giza. And the sphinx asks him a riddle. Anybody know what the riddle is? What, I don't know the specifics of what, what lot on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and then three legs at night. Exactly, what well, walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, three legs at night, and if this goes, that's easy, it's a man. Baby walks on four, and then adult walks on two. When he's old, he uses a cane, okay? And the sphinx is like, damn, and disappears. Oedipus goes into the town of Thebes, where the people tell him, you're in luck. Previous king is dead and or missing. Therefore, since you solved the riddle of the Sphinx, rid us of that plague, you get to have the queen. And he has the queen. He marries the queen and has children by her. And that's where we are. He doesn't know who the queen is. I mean, he knows her name. He doesn't know who the queen is. She's his mother. He killed his father. Okay? And the play opens with a plague. In front of the palace of Oedipus at Thebes, to the right of the stage, that is at stage right, you're on the stage looking out the audience over here. There's an altar with a priest. And it sets with a crowd of children. It's not, that's not right. The priest tells us it isn't only children that are praying at the altar. Okay? Oedipus comes up. And this is probably why your little stage direction at the top says it's children. Children, young sons, and daughters of old Cadmus. Cadmus is the legendary founder of Thebes. Why do you sit here with your suppliant crowd? Towns mingled with a heavy burden. Uh, town is heavy with a mingled burden. Sounds and smells, groans, hymns, etc., etc. He says, I, I who? I, Oedipus, whom all men call the great. What's that telling us? <laughs> Just no words. <laughs> Grunt. You know. yeah, I almost made a political comment. Um, notice he doesn't say, I who call myself the great. I mean, it's a, it's a nice little deflection there. All y'all think I'm great, right? That's kind of what he does, okay? He says, you, and he speaks to the priest, he says, come, tell me why you're here. So the ruler, or the priest says, you see our company around the altar, you see our ages, some of us, like these, cannot fly yet. That is, they're like birds, baby birds in the nest. These are toddlers, barely able to walk. Others, he says, some of us, heavy with age. You have old and young around this altar. Okay? And he tells us, he tells us what's happening. Notice Oedipus is going to say, yeah, I already knew all that. Why? Because yeah, it's great. But this is part of the exposition. This is what the audience kind of needs to know to understand. So 
A blight is on the fruitful plants of the earth. A blight is on the cattle in the fields. A blight is on our women that no children are born to them. A God that carries fire and deadly pestilence is on our town, strikes us and spares us not. The house of Cadmus is empty of its people, while black death grows rich in groaning and lamentation. Everything's dying. That's why we're here praying. And he says, We have not come as supplements to this altar because we thought of you as of a God. The Fagel's translation says, Now we pray to you. Period. You cannot equal the gods. Your children know that, bending at your altar. But we do rate you first among men. Bending at your altar. See that your altar? That could be slightly ambiguous. Because that could refer to the altar Oedipus prays at. <laughs> or it could be our altar to you. Remember what I said about the gods? Get very jealous. Rather judging you, back to the book's translation, First of men and all the chances of this life, and when we mortals have to do with more than men, that is, and when we have to deal with more than human mortal problems, we're going to come to you. Why? That's kind of elevating Oedipus. So, you solve the riddle of the Sphinx. Solve this riddle. Riddle me this, Oedipus. Why the plague? We still do this, right? We literally, we, humanity, still do this when some terrible thing happens. The Indonesian earthquake several years ago that killed over 200,000 people. There were news stories everywhere. People asking, why did this happen? Well, it's, it's simple, man. It's plate tectonics. The Earth's crust move, and when it really moves, boom, big earthquake. It's like the hurricane hitting the coast of Florida. Really? It's been happening for millions of years. Okay? But they don't understand that. So, the leader of the, the priest goes on. You solved the riddle without any help from us. Why? because you couldn't get into Thebes. The Sphinx was standing outside the gate of Thebes. To go inside, you have to get past the Sphinx. And the Sphinx demanded tribute. And I'm pretty sure it was daily. Here's the riddle. Answer it. No answer? Give me someone. I'm going to eat them. No answer? You're next. <laughs> and then you, and pick a number. And then you, and then... You solved it. And some say you were helped by the God. So, solve this one. Oedipus. He says, line 67, I've known the story before you told it only too well. That's Oedipus saying, I know all that. What do you think I am? Dumb? I know you're all sick. Okay. I know you are all sick. Yet there is not one of you, sick though you are, that is as sick as I myself. Dramatic irony. What's dramatic irony? The audience knows something that they should know. When, the character, when a character says something that the audience understands to be true, in a way, the character is totally oblivious to. See, the reason I gave kind of the general background, the audience knew the story. They went there to find out how Sophocles is going to reveal the truth to Oedipus to get his version of it. Just like Shakespeare. Every one of Shakespeare's plays is not original. He's got sources for every single play. It's what he does with the sources, however, that makes it all new. Sophocles does the same thing. So Oedipus just said what? None of you are nearly as sick as I am. And the audience is going, oh, the 
truer word, word has never been spoken because you are really sick, man. He's been living with, sleeping with his mother for how long? At this point in Oedipus's life, his eldest children, his sons, they've all left Thebes. They're in their 20s. His daughters are young girls. Uh, so 20 plus years, and they're gone. Ew. So he says, I'm already at work on it. I sent Crayon, Yocasta's brother, to Apollo. Okay, so what have we already talked about? Who's Yocasta? Mom slash wife. I sent her brother, who is his then? Uncle, Uncle slash stepbrother. Step okay, we're going to meet the kids in a while, or a couple of them, and we're going to have children slash daughter slash sister, etc. Just get all kinds of crazy. <clears throat> so he says, I sent Crayon to Apollo, to the Pythian temple that he might learn there by what act or word I could save the city. And he's like, you know, and he should have been back by now. And Oedipus kind of starts to raise this concern. What's taking Crayon so long? Okay. But when he comes, then may I prove a villain if I shall not do all the God commands. And the audience is going, well, you shouldn't say things like that. Because what is it? I will prove, I will be a villain if I don't do everything that God commands. Well, at the bottom of that page, we're going to find out what the God commands. Banish the murderer of Laius. I will be a villain if I don't do what the God commands. I will be a villain if I don't banish the murderer of Laius. Recognition. Oh, I'm the murderer of Laius. Therefore, I have to banish myself when we get to the end of the play, okay? So, Crayon comes in. Oedipus says, line 96, what's the word you bring us from the God? I should have put this up for my first class and I forgot to. Outside the Oracle of Pel uh, Delphi, there was a stone. Inscribed on the stone were two words. Know thyself. Know who you are. It doesn't mean Ted Sherman address. No. It means really know yourself. Kind of like the first thing we read. Mistress Black Veil. Pull the veil back. Really look. Okay? We'll talk about that more later. So, Crayon says, what does a god have to say? A good word. Interestingly, you could translate that. The gospel. Because that's literally what the word gospel means. I've got the good word. Okay? And then you get this qualification. For things hard to bear themselves, if in the final issue all is well, I count complete good fortune. I bring a good word. Things, let me rephrase that a little bit. Things difficult to endure themselves. If everything ends up okay at the end, I count as good fortune. Oedipus, what do you mean? How does Oedipus take Crayon's words? Uh, what are Oedipus, uh, Crayon's words? They're a riddle. Solve the riddle, Oedipus. I mean, you're the riddle master. What do you mean? What you said so far leads me uncertain whether to trust or fear. Why? Well, trust, a good word, good fortune. Notice good word at the beginning, good fortune at the end. It's the part in the middle that's a little hard to stomach. 
That's the fearful part. Why? Things hard to bear themselves. Crayon. Uh, if you'll hear my news before these others, I'm ready to speak. Or we could go inside. Put that in a modern context. What's Crayon saying? Imagine this. Something horrible has happened to the United States. We know that the president of China knows what is wrong and how to relieve it. Okay? The only reason I said president of China is, I don't know if you've seen the late, latest news, for some strange reason there is a Chinese spy balloon hovering over Montana near Malmstrom Air Force Base where we have about 150 ICBM missiles. And we're just letting it stay, <laughs> not do anything to it. Anyways, kind of strange. So, President Biden sends an emissary to President Xi, and then he comes back. And the emissary says, well, Mr. President, I'm perfectly willing to tell you everything the president of China has said out here in front of CNN and, you know, everybody else. But we can go inside and talk about it. What's Crayon's point? Let's go talk about this in private. Why? They don't need to know. Why not? What's the God command? There's a plague in Thebes and you have to banish the murderer. Or kill him. See, isn't that really kind of a kind of news you ought to keep on the down and low inside? What's the purification rite? How do I purify the city? Banish the man or kill him? Who is he? That is, what's his name? I'll get the FBI on him, you know. And what does Crayon do? He doesn't tell him the name. He says. I remember when Lias was king and starts to talk about Lias and what happened. And then Epistle's is like, I've heard of him. I have not seen him. <laughs> God commanded clearly, let someone punish with force this dead man's murderers. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up there on Monday. Use this version. It's only, um, if you print out double-sided, it's nine pages. Okay? Pretty sure you can still print for free in the library, so head on over there if you don't want to pay for it. Have a good weekend. Um, like I said, I'll put up that quiz today for Flannery O'Connor, and I'll put up the exam over the fiction also.